The Pope and Young Club wants to welcome you as we rally together to ensure our bow hunting opportunities for today and tomorrow. You've come to the podcast that believes in preserving, protecting, and promoting the passion for bow hunting. Join us as we strive to be the voice of today's bow hunter. This is the Pope and Young Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pope and Young Podcast. Jason Roundsville here, joined as always by my co-host, Dylan Ray. And we have with us from Boone and Crockett, we have Justin Spring with us today. He is the director of Big Game Records for, for Boone and Crockett. Justin, welcome. Thanks, Jason. Hey, I know um, it's kind of interesting. We're, we're chatting the other day, and Dylan and I, and, and we're like, how come we haven't had anybody from Boone and Crockett on? And we didn't have a good reason. We're just like, I don't know. We see these guys. We we work with them. We partner on a number of things. And, and it just never, I don't know why, it just never sprang up. So we thought, you know, you guys have your big event coming up. And and uh, we thought we'd have you on to talk about, you know, BNC and your your big convention and, and awards program and everything that you've got going on. So, I, I would I would love to get a history, like if you could maybe give a, a history of BNC and and why why you're here. Because I don't I don't think a lot of people realize the premise behind some of the records organizations. I know they don't for us. Right. So I mean the, the abbreviated history, Boone and Crockett was started in 1887 by Theodore Roosevelt. Um, he and some hunting buddies that had been out west, they saw the devastation of wildlife. They uh, they wanted to do something about it, so they they formulated this club. Um, one of the first things that you know we started to do was uh, the national collection of heads and horns. The idea was at the time that all these species that were fortunate enough to have the day were going to be extinct, and so the very beginning of records on the B and C side was trying to get the largest member of each species to show our generation basically what used to be here. Um, you know, you follow along with the club's history. Um, it it, it kind of parallels that of the story of conservation in North America. You know, Pittman or Robertson Fund, Wild um, National Forest Service, all, all this stuff is all very tied to BNC. We could, we could spend the whole time talking about that. Um, but basically we get into the uh, 40s and 50s, uh, conservation's working the club Boone and Crockett decided, Hey, we have this data. We no longer need to save the top specimen because we're, we're saving wildlife as a whole. People can now go out and see them, um, you know, in the parks, in the forests. And so in 1950, they revised the scoring system, um, set it up to uh, gauge big game management successes and failures. And then as you guys know, in the sixties, we were approached by Pope and Young, um, and asked if they could work with our system as well and create a similar organization yeah. for scoring. Yeah. So. And uh, yeah, and that's, and, and our entire system is based, based on the Boone and Crockett model with just a few, few minor changes here and there. So I think yeah, the biggest it, one is, is the antelope the biggest one? I, I know there's some differences there and I get questions about it. And I'm like, I, they're pretty close, I'm not a measure. So the major difference is with Boone and Crockett, our minimum scores are so high that we do not have a required inches of abnormals. So if a if a if a white tail makes it in both categories for us, we leave it up to the hunter. Okay. Or you guys say if it has what 15 inches of abnormal, it has to be a non-typical. Um, the pronghorn, um, you guys require the third circumference above the prong. We have a very, very limited number of them that those third fall completely below the prong. We will accept that. And that's, I mean, realistically, those are the biggest differences that are left. Um, you know, we, we've chatted before about the manual and we put that together. We found some common ground on a few things. Um, yeah. bison, for example, you guys used the card and we didn't, what we said is okay. Well, the, the B and C, um, entry level bison have a very defined ridge which would make sense that's where we measure um, maybe a less mature bison wouldn't have that as much so what we say is if there's a ridge that's where it has to be taken if there's not a ridge you're appropriate to card the base so it's very very minimal differences nice um and we, we work really hard to make sure it's easily understood by everybody and and 
why, why those differences exist where they do. Yeah. And I know even some of our position statements as we've been working on them, uh, you know, we'll reach out so that we can get your guys' take and say, hey, you know, before we just go out on a limb here, what's something, you know, how does how does Boone and Crockett treat this so that, you know, we're not always the same, but we try, we try not to go in without at least understanding each other's version of why the rules are a certain way. Oh, no, and for sure. And I mean, it, it, to me, it's always been very clear if, if there's a particular – um, you know, slight difference. It generally comes down to the variation in mission. You know, you guys are for the protection and betterment of bow hunting. We're looking at wildlife management, you know, 99.9% .9 of everything is going to be the same, but there are certain issues that we do differ a little bit on, but it's very, you know, very explainable. Yeah. Yeah. And I know, and then you guys take, take walruses. How, uh, how many of those do you get in a year? Um, We still get a few. There's, there, there, you can pick them up in Alaska still. So we still do see some. Okay. Um, there is some coastal dwelling native Alaskans that do harvest them. We do see on occasion the harvested walrus, not, not commonly, but they're around. So, you know, every once in a while, we, we'll see the occasional Atlantic come in. Um, they can't send them to the lower 48. You can't import them, but they can be scored and verified in Canada. So it, it's not unheard of, but it's noteworthy when we see what come through the door. Gotcha. Okay. And then how about um, one of the things, as I was looking through one of our, one of our first books, we used to have a category for Jaguar. Have you guys ever had a Jaguar category? We have and still do. Um, still do. Okay. Yeah. Boone and Crockett, you know, we, just because they can't be hunted anymore, that doesn't mean that it's not still scientifically valid. We accept right. picked up heads. We're looking at what that species has done. You know, it's it's just as important to say we used to be able to harvest these. We can't now. But say a jaguar wanders into Arizona, uh, dies in natural causes, we would put that in the book because that habitat did create that animal. You know, okay. so we yes, we still have a jaguar category. No, we haven't got a jaguar in in the 14 plus years that I've been here. But yeah, yeah it's still a category we recognize. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I was surprised to see that because it's not one of ours now. But, uh, you know, I almost wonder if we go back because because I think we recognize 29 species. I wonder if there's anybody that has all 30 that's uh, that's still going now. I don't know when when was the last time you could hunt jaguars. Uh, pre 70s. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not, I don't even I'm not even positive on that. Yeah, it's been a long time. Well, yeah. yeah. So now, I bet it's uh, in one of those books behind you somewhere. Yeah, it probably is. That's that's a. Uh, if you uh, have to have talking. a ladder for your bookshelf, you're doing all right. No, no, indeed, we do have a ladder for the bookshelf. Yeah, <laughs> that's you know, Dylan. Not everybody can reach the the top shelf, <laughs> but but the, those who can't reach the top shelf fit a lot better on airplanes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Justin, I know, uh, I know you have your big event coming up here in Missouri with the big game awards, um, and the display. Tell us about that for folks who, who haven't been to one before, what can they expect at that? Yeah. So the event is July 21 through 23. The, uh, the display of all the invited heads that, that were submitted for panel judging is actually open now that opened May one. So if you go to the, uh, Johnny Morris wonders of wildlife museum, um, the hall that they usually have their king of bucks uh, display in is now all um, those those top category or those top specimens from our, our awards program. Um, so again, that's open then on the 21st, that's Thursday of July. We have a big welcome reception um, that night. You know, folks are all welcome to come to that. You can get online and register. There's registration fee and then, you know, you're welcome to come to whatever event you want on um Friday morning, we do an open meeting with all of our official measures that, you know, again, folks are willing, they're welcome to come listen in. We talk to them about what they're seeing, what we're seeing in the office, kind of an open dialogue between our 1,450 measures and, and you know, the records leadership. Uh, after that, we do an official measure appreciation lunch where all of our measures and attendants get a belt buckle and we, you know, kind of thank them for all the efforts they put in. Um, and then that uh, that evening is our youth awards. Any any youth hunter 16 or younger that has submitted a trophy is invited to attend. 
they're called up on stage, we recognize their accomplishment. Um, and then Saturday, we do a uh, lifetime associate luncheon. Again, thanking our lifetime associates. There's an auction in the afternoon featuring hunts and guns and different cool uh, BNC unique items. And then that evening is our Saturday Big Game Awards banquet, which where um, we recognize all those hunters that had sent in their trophies for for panel measuring. And, and I hear you're going to be a part of that this time around, Jason, you're going to join us down there. Yeah, I think so. Looks like uh, I've, I've got my, my flights booked, who knows with the way things have been the last two years, I, I hate to commit until I'm actually on an airplane and in the right city these days. Yeah. I'm, I'm considering driving just to make sure that I'm there with, with yeah. the issues that we've been having. And I, it's not just, you know, Missouri, it's just airline travel in general from what I've been seeing lately. Yeah, no, we're excited to be uh, one of the sponsors of that that award this year for the um, the Glen St. Charles Outstanding Bow Hunting Award. So um, for you guys, I, I think that's uh, yep. great. And once again, just just demonstrates our our further partnership. So um, just so you I'll, guys know, it was 1973 on the Jaguars. OK, that's good to know. That's <laughs> I had to look it up. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then with, uh, now your awards program, we do every other year and you guys are every three. Correct. Yep. We're in a triennial. So this is, uh, this is all the trophies received in 19, 20 and 21. Okay. And, uh, and are you guys usually in, in, in Springfield? I know that's a great place with the museum and the facilities and obviously yeah. Johnny Morris, big supporter of both of ours. Right. No, we we have bounced around. We've been in different locations. This is the third time we've been in Springfield. Um, considering it's within the half day or yeah, day's drive of half of the U.S. population, it's a pretty hard venue to try to beat somewhere else. Um, you know, I don't know if we'll be there for eternity, but it's it's been working very well. Johnny's a big supporter. He's also, you know, one of our members as well. And so he, yeah. he does a great job, makes us feel super welcome. They roll out the red carpet it'd be pretty hard for us to, to go somewhere else at this point at least yeah yeah that's nice um i definitely know that's one of their they're working on a museum for us and and uh and uh, i think it's the uh but, well a whole a whole bow hunting wing actually so we're excited about the future potential there and what that's going to entail and and uh wouldn't be surprised if you never know someday you might see us holding an event there <laughs> yeah no i mean they've also got our our national collection you know like i said what we originally started was in the bronx mm -hmm. zoo um it was actually in wyoming for a while we had it in virginia for a while it's now in their museum as well year round so not only do we have our national collection right now we also have our awards program heads in there if you had to pick one of, of everything in that room what's the one that you're like dang chadwick room like okay. it, it's that stone sheep you know number one i mean that's that's the one that that realistically probably will never be beaten okay um, the history of it's just amazing gotcha yeah that's um it's interesting when you look at like like our top award is an issue award every every other year or every biennial and um it's interesting here in the discussions of how those are selected and the, the thought that goes into who's going to get it. If we're even giving it out, because we've had a lot of years where we have not had a trophy that we felt was, you know, I mean, even world records where we just thought, eh, you know, it's not truly spectacular or it, it's right. not, it, it just, uh, you know, I look at some of these things. I'm like, man, it's, it's pretty impressive. So, um, but I do know not only how they how they hit our records, but even how they hit your books has some some kind of bearing on on the Ishi Award as well. Yeah, I mean our our equivalent of it's the Sagamore Hill Award. It's actually given by the Roosevelt family, but it's very similar to you guys' the Ishi Award. It's not given every time. It, it takes a absolutely magnificent specimen, and then the hunt for taking it has to be just as equally as impressive. Gotcha. Um, you know, we, we, we put just as much emphasis on the fair chase side of the hunt for that award as we do just the, the overall ranking. And it's got to have both, which is the very rare trophy. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, so road hunting is not allowed on that. <laughs> now, have you ever had your driving? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you can't, well, I mean, you can enter it if you hit it with your car. It, you just wouldn't get that award if you hit it with your car. Yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't see a vehicle collision getting anybody a, uh, a Sagamore Hill. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's neat. You know, when you look through some of the records, it's kind of neat when you look at, at some of these folks that are bringing in, you know, just amazing world-class or even sometimes world record deadheads that they're finding on the mountain where these things are dying of old age before hunters are taking them. And what a true testament to wildlife populations that, that an animal can grow to that size and magnitude and evade, you know, all, all the folks that are chasing it. And a lot of people know they're there. They just can't, still can't get it done. Right. So that's, uh, that always impresses me. Now, what, um, it, if you had to say, um, one of the things, obviously records probably takes a lot of your time, but, but what is one thing that, that Boone and Crockett spends time on that most folks out there might not realize? Actually, it's probably about 90% of what, what we do is, is not known by the majority of people. The, the records the records is the public facing piece of it. Yeah, yeah, everybody knows that we keep track of these big game animals, but the majority of our, our, our time and efforts is um, university programs. We have endowed professorships around the country where we're ensuring that the North American model is being taught to these up and coming wildlife managers. Um, we have a ranch on the Rocky Mountain front where we host Boy Scout high adventure troops. They go pack rafting. We bring in school groups. We do, um, we open it up to different groups for different events coming in there to see this ranch that we purchased at our centennial to demonstrate um, that you could do a running a working cattle ranch and benefit wildlife. We have a, a very strong presence in DC um, with the whole whole committee on uh, conservation policy and and moving forward some of these um, major legislation you know bills that, that need need to be need to be taken care of um, we we have folks working on that so you know like I said again the records is what everybody knows I get a lot of the glory but very it's a very very small portion of what this club does yeah that's that's the same thing we've run into that all the time they're like I had no idea that you guys did anything. I thought you were just a book. And I was like, no, that's once again, just a small part of, of what we are, even as much as it's a, a big part of our identity. Cause right. it is, that's, that's the part everybody sees. And, you know, I have stuff come across my desk uh, probably every week. Um, you know, that, that we're lending the bow hunters voice to and, and uh, on the conservation front all across state issues, national issues. Um, I mean, all the way up to farm bill stuff. Right. So um, now what is, what's your favorite animal to go chase? Yeah. I don't really have a personal favorite. I'll get real mad at about any of them, depending on which one I get a tag for. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I really like I really like bear hunting. Um, spot and stock bear has always been a pretty cool thing for me. A time of year that there's usually not a lot of people out there, been kind of cooped up all winter. That that seems to get me pretty excited. But that's that's what we're just wrapping up. So maybe that's why that's my answer today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it was Jack Frost. Is is we said, hey, what's what's your favorite hunt? He says my next one. Mm -hmm. We're like, what is that? He's like, I'm just going home to hunt whitetails but that's my, you know, whatever I've got coming up is kind of the next one. Right. And so for you, what is your, what would you consider your, your best personal hunting trophy? Oh man. Um, we did a, I did a 21 day moose float in Alaska a DIY thing that, that we killed a pretty good bull on. And that, that whole experience being out there for that long, doing it on our own was, was by far the best. Um, you know, trophy wise, maybe it's not the biggest bull ever, but you know, like I said, I mean, be, being out there alone on our own, doing it, everything we saw, that one kind of takes the cake for me of the of the best experience. Gotcha. I was kind of thinking you might slide in the emperor goose. 
Emperor Goose is pretty <laughs> awesome. Walrus is grunt next when you're in a layout boat. That was a unique experience too. But yeah, I know there we've I've been fortunate. I got to see a lot of cool stuff. And you know, those experiences are all all pretty, pretty unique. Yeah, very good. And so what is on your bucket list? Uh, I'd, I'd really like to get a bison. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, there's there's a couple hunts out there that are, you know, legitimate, very hard to draw, very hard to get. Um, there's an archery hunt in Utah that I'd be real interested in. There's an Alaska hunt I'd be real interested in. Um, just kind of the ultimate, like, how are you going to get out there and get this 2,000 pound animal back? And uh, that that that's the one that if I if I uh, somehow won the lottery and could buy any tag, it, it would be a bison tag, I think. That's nice. We just had uh, Corky Richardson on, who holds the world record uh, bison for us, and uh, he was talking about his hunt, and and he's been pretty instrumental in Arizona with their entire bison program. So it was kind of neat to hear um, all that had gone in to to that. You know, even even to the point of getting hunting, getting bow hunting allowed during the bison season, it was pretty yeah. pretty interesting. Well, I mean, to hear it's that. interesting too. The the bison's one of the few species that we were not able to overwhelmingly recover. Um, you know, the the requirements that a bison herd has are, are not real conductive to a developed landscape. And yeah. So you know, there's there's not a lot of places that a bison can really be a bison. And so, you know, be, being able to train, and that, that there's a reason that it's such a limited opportunity, you know, you don't want to obviously detract from the population, but, you know, there's just not a lot of places that you can have that big uninterrupted landscape that they were originally on. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, kudos to the wildlife managers for finding ways, you know, to allow some, some take here and there when, when the opportunity presents, you know, and, uh, like some of these bison herds and, and even, you know, that emperor goose, I man, 10 years ago, did you ever think you'd ever be able to hunt those? I didn't. Yeah, no. I mean, it's, it's amazing to see those, those recovery stories of, you know, being on the list and then coming back to a point where, you know, Alaska residents could hunt it and then they opened it up to a limited number of non-residents. Um, you know, that's, that's a huge wildlife success. And it's a lot of people lost on a lot of people, you know, the fact that we've got a surplus now and this is available and people get to experience that. I mean, that's, that's why we do what we do at Boone and Crockett and the same with you guys, you know, yeah, those opportunities and making sure that stuff's available for the future generations. Yeah. And it's, it's exciting. And, and it's, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, it's clearly the cost, the whole conservation is clearly sportsman driven and, uh, and, and it's almost exactly the opposite of how some of the folks that don't really understand wildlife populations and hunting, it's, it's almost exactly the opposite of how they think it is. They think, oh, you're out there killing everything. And when in fact, what we give back is considerably more than what we take out of, out of a population. No, for sure. Yeah. And then the whole the whole funding, you know, the North American model, that's a big thing that, um, you know, Boone and Crockett has always tried to be at the forefront of, of making sure folks remember that, you know, in fact, it was some of our members that that really put, you know, pen to paper and, and kind of summarized you know, what the model was and and what folks use now as a definition. Now, it wasn't like it was created, but, you know, that that hunter funding um it's it's billions of dollars between that and Pittman or Robertson. I mean, that's yeah. why we have the wildlife today, you know. And so it, it's very important for folks to realize that that that's that's the funding. And you want to do away with hunting, you have a moral issue with it, you're going to lose all your wildlife as it sits now. Yeah. Or let's uh, you know let's let's have you know anti hunters. Let's see if they will impose self-impose a tax to make sure conservation persists. You know, let's see if they'll you know put a a tax on you know tofu that will replace the billions of dollars that Pittman Robertson's making every year. Funny you bring up tofu. How much land is locked up in, in soybean production to create that tofu that's taking out of take, taken out of wildlife habitat? Yeah. Know? Yeah, that that doesn't get talked about. Yeah, 
Um, so what is, uh, what, I mean, you guys have been around, how, how many years have you been here? What is it? The, the club was 1887. To... 1887. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a long, that's close enough. What, uh, what is the next big thing or the next exciting thing that, that folks are, are looking from? I know it's for me, I, I hear about you guys all the time and I'm like, it's neat that, you know, you continue to do more and more to give back. And, uh, and so what is kind of the next thing that you guys have rolling out? Our big um, push right now is poaching pay. It's uh, it kind of started as a research project where, we were looking to states to say, hey, you know, is there something we can do with our records to help you guys get, um, uh, you know, trophy payments from people for poaching, you know, restitution. That's the word I'm looking for. So we were trying to say, hey, what what can we do to help you guys with restitution to help you recoup some loss from poaching? You know, let's let's make sure folks understand that poaching is not hunting. Those are two very different no. things. And so uh, what we did is we started doing this research and it became readily apparent that there's some major issues out there that, that need addressed at the, the legislative level almost. Um, you know, folks, folks have a hard time really recognizing what the value of wildlife is. And a judge may be sitting on the bench and he has a, you know, some horrible crimes that sandwiched in between as a guy that's two fish over to them. It doesn't really, they don't see that as a, as an actual take. And so what we're trying to do is, is give a monetary value to this illegal harvest. And then maybe we can go to the, the legislators and say, hey, you know, FYI, you're losing $15 million a year that could be going to your wildlife agency by not prosecuting these poachers. And so right. it's, and it's, it's this whole long um, project of really, really figuring out what is the value of a, of a poached doe? What's the value of a poached trophy? You know, how much is that taking out of the state's pocket? And what is the poacher, what does he owe the state? And then teaching folks that like, hey, you know, you could have this many more millions of dollars in your wildlife budget to, to help other species if we could stop this. Yeah, because you look at that, we, we've actually measured some bucks um, at our office in Minnesota because they, they actually go on score to determine value. And so... Um, yeah, you you look at that, and especially on some of these really big animals that that get that get taken out of season, which I liken poaching to hunting, much as I do a bank withdrawal to an armed robbery. Those yeah. those are exactly the same. It's like one of them is, you know, all legal and consensual; the other one is not, and 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 no one condones it. Hunters. Hunters do not condone poaching because it takes away from from us, it takes away from everybody, it takes away from the resource, and so it, it's it's always been interesting to me to see the ways that that it's quantified or or in other cases that it's not quantified, and you're like, oh, you know, a five hundred dollar fine, and you're like, well, man, I I'd have paid three thousand dollars to to have a chance at a, at a buck like that, or, you know, I mean, there, there are, there are always opportunity costs. So it's nice that, that you're moving forward to show them that. Yeah. And we're, I mean, we're finding, we're finding stuff that we didn't expect as this research progresses, you know, there's, there's numerous types of poaching. I mean, obviously the, the worst of the worst is the guy that goes out at night, shoots a giant trophy and cuts its head off and wastes everything. But there's a whole gradient of, of different motivations for poaching, and you have to quantify that as well when you're trying to figure out how you address it. And so that's that's our big push right now. That's our, our, our next big thing. But, you know, as always, Boone and Crockett's always involved legislatively. Um, you know, there's, there's always things that are popping up. I mean, we're looking at the grizzly bears in Montana. There's, there's some high densities of bears. There's some predation issues, that ranch that we have. Um, you know, we're, we're working with the feds to see if there's some way that we can address problem bears, you know, um, as it sits now, the response time, you know, by the time they get up there to see if the kill, you know, what, what happened, there's six or seven bears on there. We well, obviously can't deal with all of them. And they don't know who the, uh, the culprit bear may be. So we're always working on issues like that, that we see trying to make sure that there's place on the landscape for the ranchers and the bears. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
gosh, are they? I, I'm just, I kind of lost my train of thought. So I'm like, there's that many bears there right now. You just don't expect to see that many. Yeah, it's it's kind of insane. Some of these areas, you you can go and expect to see a grizzly bear or three. Wow. And then, so that population is, I'm assuming, expanding. I mean, where is that from where it was 10, 30 years ago? You know, being a resident of Montana, we see it quite a bit. I mean, they're moving they're moving east away from the Rocky Mountain front out into the plains, which they were historically there. You read Lewis and Clark's journals. I mean, yeah, there, there, there was bears on the plains. Um, the food out there is a lot easier, but it's areas that haven't seen grizzlies in hundreds of years. And so grain silos are getting hit. You know, people that you're out in a, you're out in a wheat field and the grizzly bear comes strolling by. Um, it makes the news like, holy, holy smokes, yeah. man, look what's here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's funny because, um, you know, you, you and I are actually from pretty close to the same. I think we only grew up about an hour or so apart in Western Oregon. And so here where we're at, there's a lot of, you know, forest land and, and a little more, more wild stuff than, than you see. And I, I remember one time, I think I was in Alberta and I saw a black bear literally sitting on his, you know, sitting on his rump in a barley field, just munching away. And, and you're like, there's a bear right there. And he just, he didn't even care. He's like, yeah. oh man, groceries are, groceries are here today. So it was just a little bit different than what i was used to seeing yeah no and, and i mean is it cool to see a grizzly bear yeah but when you see a grizzly bear with three adult cubs in somebody's yard that that makes you a little nervous and even you know even people that love wildlife it's still i, I wouldn't want that in my front yard yeah yeah or yeah i wouldn't want to meet my dog right yeah and uh so what other what other issues like that do, are you guys in the middle of right now? I mean, the, the awards has got us pretty tied up, um, you know, for most of 22 as well. These are kind of ongoing projects. We are we are looking at, um, oh, kind of kind of trying to reach out to a little bit of a younger demographic with a with a media campaign, trying to to, to show folks that, you know, hey man, like this conservation thing needs your support. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks, uh, our generation, especially Jason, we, we, there's always been deer. There's always been wildlife, you know, the generations before us, they actually saw it when it was depressed. And so trying to convince the younger generation that like, we do have the b potential to reduce wildlife to minuscule numbers. If we don't, you know, keep everything in check, it's, it's hard to convince somebody of something that they've never seen. Yeah. So we're, we're always working on that, trying to reach that younger demographic and be like, Hey, you know, if we're not careful with technology, we could reduce populations. If we're not careful with development, we could have this effect. You know, all those things we're always trying to to keep conservation at the forefront and make sure we're not making mistakes that might have been made in the history and just forgot about. Yeah. Yeah. We've had quite a few, you know, success stories in our time. You know, the emperor's one of them. And, you know, here in Oregon, the the cackler, Canada goose. I mean, that thing you know, when I started to do something, you couldn't shoot them. It was a federal offense if you took a cackler. Now it makes up, I think it's 75 or 80% of the bag in Western Oregon for geese. Yep. And it's just, you know, a complete 180 from where it was. And, you know, 30 years ago, a turkey was kind of a rare thing in, in this area. And, and now all of a sudden there's you know, quite a few more than there used to be. So it's neat to see those success stories. I mean, you, you see them in black bear, black bear populations in the, the southeastern United States. They stay putting in seasons. Um, you know, we're seeing a, a, an increase in the size of bears. I mean, there's there's wildlife success stories everywhere. And as an industry, we maybe don't do the best telling the stories of it. You know, it, it seems that that doom and gloom sells. And so that's what your your yeah. feeds are you're filled with. And and Man, there's there's a lot, like you said, you know, the cackler. I mean, the baldy. How many how many stories are there out there that that we brought stuff back from the brink, you know, through through conservation funded by hunters? Absolutely, yeah. It's um, it's interesting, and and then, 
here, you know, in, in the black tail deer zone, we've seen a big difference because it, it's, um, you know, when the spotted owl shut down a lot of the logging on national forest ground, um, all of a sudden they're just where you'd go out and see 50 deer in a, in a morning, just driving around looking. Now there's, there's not a deer to be found. And so it's definitely changed. I don't know if it's, I know it's had an impact in a lot of places. Um, but there's still very good opportunities around, but, but in a lot of areas up in the Cascades, especially some of that coast range stuff, it's, it's really changed the carrying capacity for, for deer, just, just the logging practices. Yeah, no, it has. And, and we see this in a lot of places, you know, what? generally speaking, you've got numerous things going on and, and Oregon is a prime example. You know, you had, you had hair loss disease that hit the blacktails right about the time I left. Um, you've got, you know, an increasing cougar population, you know, due to legislative action, you couple that and the hair loss with a reduced amount of, of early successional forest, you, you, you do find, you know, they're facing numerous things and they're not doing as well. I still try to get back when I can and, you know, hunt the old stomping grounds and you're right. Yeah. It, it, it's not like it used to be by any means. Um, you know, the elk, elk harvest have shifted from, from very predominant, you know, public land units to more of these private timber company held yep. units because there's harvest going on there, you know, and it's, it's not all, you know, it's not like we can go and, and just flip a switch and deal with one problem and fix it. It's, it's an overall management approach that we need to look at. We need, we need healthy forests. We need, we need realistic predator management, but not eradication. No, cougars have just as much of a place on the landscape as anything else. They just don't have the only place on the landscape. So yeah, it's all challenging. It's all, it's all good stuff that needs to be talked about. Yeah. And it's, um, that's one of the reasons we're really high on, on, management being left you know we put out a position statement where you know our position is that management of wildlife resources needs to be left in the hand of professional wildlife managers not you know voters at the ballot box because it's it is a complex issue and, and a lot of times they tend to go um you know just single species management doesn't work you know right. like like they tried to do that for you know the spotted owl well um all that did was hurt all, basically everything else you know deer elk bears i mean it's it's uh it's just not a viable way of landscape level management yeah that's i mean that's another thing that, that boone and crockett's very heavily involved in you know we actually i mean theodore roosevelt started the forest service gift or um yeah Pincho was the first chief of the Forest Service. He was a club member. At the beginning, I mean, when they set up the Forest Service, they they said that it had to be used. The ideas of parks was not going to work. It was a managed resource. And so right. the, club, the club from our founding has always been, you know, healthy forests, multiple use, you know, and, and we're still we're still working on that today, you know, trying to trying to get, you know, fire suppression, fire, you know, fuel reductions, different projects that can be done on our national forest. That's another, another angle that bnc is very involved in and nobody you know nobody reads an article about the newest world record muskox and it's like oh those guys are working on forests too so <laughs> yeah yeah it's not quite the same headline <laughs> but e even though for a lot of us it's it's you know exponentially more valuable it it still doesn't quite make the headline right yeah so it's yeah it's interesting it's it's um as somebody who grew up hunting a lot of public ground, it's very nice to see organizations kind of banding together to to keep an eye on that and keep a keep them open. I know it's pretty sad when when you talk about the old stomping grounds. You know, you go to places where where you used to to hunt or shoot or whatnot, and now it's all gates and no you know no trespassing signs or Walmart parking lots. There's there's actually a house that sits on the flat that I shot my first Roosevelt elk on. Yeah, like right right where I was standing when I shot the elk. There's now a house. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what you're saying is that they just need the right well placed windows. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
Well, I'll tell you what, Justin, what, one of the questions we ask every guest on this show is when you find yourself, whether it's chasing muskox or, or uh, mountain hunts, what is one thing that you like to have, maybe a non-traditional item you like to have with you on a hunt? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie. My weakness is the, uh, is the uh, lightweight cot. I don't go anywhere without my cot. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that, that's, I mean, realistically, we do a lot of ultralight type stuff. I mean, clearly when you're as big as me, you don't want to be carrying extra weight in your backpack too. Yeah. Um, but that, that's the one, the one item that I splurge on that, that always ends up if we're staying out is, is that little cot. That's, that's my go-to that I have to have. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I, I, my, I, I like to have a camp shower, but it's not exactly backpack accessible. Right. It's like, yeah. So I'm like, well, I could hike in, but how close could I get a truck or a bike? So I can, <laughs> well, our, uh, I, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing your show there coming up. Gosh, next month no pressure yeah well uh, you guys got a handle on it you know we've done a few of them i, I think we're sitting good but i mean as, as you're aware every everyone's a little bit different and a little bit you know a little bit different uh hand you're dealt trying to make it happen so yeah well i'm i'm for one looking forward to it and uh if uh if folks can't get there, hopefully they, they check it out and, and learn all about Boone and Crockett and the great things you guys are doing. So, yeah, um, I mean, I'll do a, a shameless plug. Our, our online auctions up and available now. So if you, uh, if you want to get on the website, you can check that out. If you can't join us, maybe, maybe there's an item there that you can help support the club through that. So yeah, um, we'd love to see all everybody there in person, but if not, you know, we, we'd love your help in supporting conservation and fair chase hunting. I think I'm already registered for that one on the okay. online hunting auctions.com yep. okay, a couple things in there and you know i don't presume to be able to compete with some of the folks you're going to have there at your event but you never know sometimes you can sneak uh, you know even us poor boys can sneak one in hey, at least between you and i we're in enough auctions you can usually find a pretty good deal if you're yeah in attention <laughs> yeah and i've always said us you know the uh you know the high bidder is is beneficial to an auction but the person that makes your auction is your number two bidder right because if you've got somebody willing to pay a thousand dollars and your number two bidder stops at a hundred it's selling for 150 bucks mm -hmm. if your number two bidder goes to 950 it just sold for a thousand they didn't spend a penny but they just <laughs> made you eight hundred dollars so yeah we need uh we need those number two bidders so go check it out um that's actually the same forum that we use so our folks should be pretty familiar with it so anyway justin thanks for joining us today um as always we appreciate the partnership and working together i know there's a lot of things that that we do from the measuring manual to the joint classes and uh we look forward to continued partnership and and i'll see you next month in springfield yeah well, one quick question for you before you get off what's uh, what's your next event for your field judging championship you know, we're actually working on that right now. That one was uh, was a lot of fun. You know, Dallas Smith and his team put on a really good show. We're trying, and and it was so great at the Baku Center because we had space indoors to set up trophies and and mounts and optics. And so we're actually trying to go through the logistics of taking that on a on a wider scale, getting it to mountain archery festivals, getting it to all these other places where, you know, where we can find a way to logistically make it happen. I think you qualified. So you, so you'll get to, I, I did. And I, you know, I, 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 I had a lot of fun with that. I think it was a really good guy, idea you guys came up with. And, and, you know, if there's anything we can do to help you promote that, let us know. We sure appreciate it. Yeah. It's, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a measure and that was part, I mean, you were there, Tim, our director of records was there. We had a bunch of official measures and we actually had a measuring class that, that a lot of them participated in that. And so I was actually close or I was actually glad that I just got close on a few. I didn't place <laughs> in the top three, but I wasn't, you know, I'm just like, oh man, I have no idea. I just hope I'm not 20 inches off. So 
um, the one, I think that white tail gave me some fits. I think gross. I was, I was pretty darn close, but the net had, it had some nuances that I, nobody like me was going to get. So yeah. that was a lot of fun. So no, appreciate it. And we'll definitely keep you guys in the loop and, and, uh, and make sure that, that we're partnering on that as well. So Justin, thanks for joining us, man. Uh, look forward to seeing you here before too long. Sounds good, Jason.